Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Earlier this week, Israelis braced themselves for a flare-up along the country's northern border. The leader of Iran's Lebanese proxy Hezbollah, Said Hassan Nasrallah, promised retaliation for certain Israeli actions a week prior. In the events, Nasrallah made good on his pledge, yet the incident ended without casualties, a fact that mitigated prospects for further escalation. Is the tension really over, or is it just a temporary respite? To analyze this question, we're joined here in the studio by Dr. Iran Lerman, who's the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security and a lecturer at Shalim College. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Professor Ephraim Inbar, who is the President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a more wide-scale update on the developments uh, that happened since the attack on Sunday. Once in a while, people uh, outside of Israel uh, hear of uh, various incidents between Israel and uh, its neighbors, and uh, sometimes uh, it seems as if it is all part of uh, one big conflict. But one has to uh, to take each front uh, um, out of uh, the uh, context and look at uh, each particular case. What has happened uh, uh, recently was more on the southern border of Israel, between Israel and Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic uh, Jihad in Gaza. But the incidents uh, to which you refer took place on Israel's northern uh, border. There were earlier two incidents in which Israel struck at um, a Shiite squad, people from Lebanon, but acting under Iranian uh, command, who were prepared in Syria uh, to launch drones against uh, civilian Israeli targets. And uh, this was preempted. And coincidentally, even though um, uh, there was no connection between the two, there was uh, some mishap which uh, took place when uh, Israeli drones, again, almost the same uh, aerial vehicle, but uh, this time not anti-Israeli, but uh, uh, probably Israeli, even though Israel has never admitted responsibility, uh, took action within Beirut. And they uh, acted against a particular um, part of the uh, Hezbollah Precision Guided Munitions uh, Project, which uh, Israel uh, is dedicated uh, to avert. Now, in retaliation for these two uh, incidents, or uh, at least for the first one in which two Lebanese uh, were killed, uh, Nasrallah, whom you mentioned, vowed to retaliate. And this was uh, quite exceptional because for the last 13 years, ever since the Second Lebanon War, uh, in 2006, the um, Israeli-Lebanese border was very quiet. There were um, attacks uh, in Syria, in Iraq, in other places, but Israel um, has tried to avoid attacking Lebanese targets because Nasrallah's threats uh, sounded credible. This time around, uh, he again threatened. He made good on his threat, but Israel managed uh, to avoid casualties um, during this incident and therefore saw no need to retaliate for the retaliation. This doesn't mean that it is all over, but uh, for the time being, it looks as if uh, both sides were satisfied with the uh, results. Dr. Lerman, uh the whole situation on the north was quite odd to me, uh, to a certain degree at least. Um, Hezbollah pledged to attack Israeli targets. Israel uh, was wise enough to withdraw from the border, establishing certain uh, decoys and uh, establishing uh, uh, other um, components in order to avert possible uh, targeting of its own forces. But uh, Hezbollah uh, seemed to me that it got frustrated at some point and launched an anti uh, an anti uh, tank missile, a cornet, uh, from uh, relatively three uh, missiles, but from a relative far distance to a moving 
target, which uh, we all uh, know quite well is uh, the chances of it hitting its target uh, once it's moving is not the biggest uh, uh, when, it, when we're putting the factor into place. Was this just a sense of uh, we're trying to show that we can follow through on our pledge or was this a concrete effort in order to harm Israeli soldiers and really extract uh, uh, as much as possible damage from, from Israel? I think we, we have to look at this through two very different perspectives. One is uh, the rising tensions that Iran is causing across the region. That's essentially part of it. And it has to do with the immense pressure that Iran is under. Hezbollah cannot be analyzed and cannot look at, his, at their actions entirely as if they are a Lebanese organization. They are first and foremost an Iranian proxy. So that, that's one part of the story. This is why Israel uh, is focused in its readiness, in its uh, priorities on the north rather than on the south. And Amir was right that most of our disturbances in recent months actually came from the south. But our focus strategically, and as, as uh, our uh, institute has uh, suggested more than once, needs to remain focused upon Iranian-induced challenges. So that's the larger strategic picture. But then you go into tactical resolution. And uh, Hezbollah is uh, a very, uh, under, under Hassan Nasrallah, it turned out, mm. but we made a big mistake, everyone says in Israel, when we uh, disposed of his uh, predecessor, uh, Mosavi, um, more than 20, 27 years ago, um, and, 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 and ended up bringing to power over this organization a very able, sophisticated operator with a penchant for psychological warfare and the capacity normally, normally, I'm saying this because he made, a, uh, by his own admission, a catastrophic mistake in 2006. He misread Israel and, and led to a war that he did, was not uh, planning for. But uh, in most cases, he has a very good ability to uh, choose his means in a very measured and, and, and sophisticated way. So uh, uh, the, pre the president, uh, by the way, also using a uh, Cornet attack at the edge of the capacity of this uh, Russian-made um, munition, was in uh, January 2015 in retaliation for an Israeli operation in the Golan. And at that time, it did take the lives of two Israelis. Uh, this time, I'm not even sure he wanted to kill Israelis, but he, he wanted to look as if he may have killed Israelis. And interestingly enough, because we have a very good sense of how he plays the game, this time we rolled in with his role play and, uh, and faked a medevac. I don't think that's ever happened in Israeli history. Mm -hmm. uh, leaving aside the political dimension of all of this in two weeks before an election, uh, this was basically designed to give him what he wanted and terminate the, uh, the event and, and bring the North with its uh, the last 13 years, 14 years of prosperity and stability, 13 years of stability and prosperity back to normal. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very, it was very cal well calculated on both sides uh, with one difference. We have very clearly an intelligence capacity as to what Hezbollah is doing that they do not fully have as to what we are doing. They have good eyes, we have good ears. Indeed. Um, I'd like to ask you, Professor Inba, with regard to the Iranian involvement in this entire story. The two operatives that were killed in the Israeli strike in uh, Syria a week prior to uh, the attack on Sunday uh, were not necessarily members of Hezbollah, they were members of the Iranian Quds Force, uh, or at least operating on behalf of the Iranian Quds Force, but one of them uh, reportedly was a son of a, a senior figure uh, in Hezbollah, uh, raising the question whether Iran was actually the one who tried to pressure certain leaders within Hezbollah to force the hand on Hassan Nasrallah, who quite clearly is not really keen on dragging his organization to another round uh, with Israel after uh, um, being still uh, part of the, the Syrian 
uh, axis in the battle to reclaim uh, uh, the lands of Syria to the Assad regime, and at the same time also being very um, uh, wary of Israeli capabilities, uh, considering the fact that Hezbollah now in Lebanon is acquiring more and more power as it has never seen before. How do you see Iran actually orchestrating such an attack and uh, successfully uh, forcing Hezbollah into a confrontation with Israel? Well, first of all, I think that it's clear that there is a war going on between Israel and Iran. And they are fighting back to the best of their ability. Uh, and we try to suppress their uh, abilities in harming uh, Israelis. Uh, therefore, uh, he tries, uh, the Iranians try uh, to um, a very measured escalation with Hezbollah. Uh, they don't want uh, Hezbollah to go uh, uh, full steam ahead against Israel because they keep Hezbollah for a rainy day uh, when uh, they will face an Israeli attack on their uh, nuclear, uh, critical nuclear installations. They also is a very delicate game. And uh, frankly, I'm not sure we should participate in such a game. We have a clear interest in uh, uh, shutting down the Hezbollah capability, you know, over 100,000 missiles to attack Israel. I'm not sure we have the adequate defensive uh, shield to deal with such a great number of, uh, of missiles. So maybe this could have been an opportunity for us. Uh, and I'm not speaking about the political calendar, which because, you know, it's a different calculation. But this could be an uh, opportunity for, for the IDF to finally put into effect some of the plans that they have been training for. We have to go in, in southern Lebanon. We have to take care of their ability to harm us in a very significant way. This capability has uh, to be dealt with uh, probably before we have to go to for an for a attack against Iran. Mm -hmm. You know, in 1982, Israel went into war, and one of the pretexts was that uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization has one howitzer, one cannon, uh, with a range of 40 kilometers, threatening the northern part of Israel, uh, the Galilee. Now we have gotten used to uh, 100,000 rockets and missiles. But the difference is that we are now in the uh, PGM, Precision Guided Munitions uh, era, uh, which started uh, perhaps by uh, Russian military thinkers who called it the revolution of military in military affairs, not a military revolution, because this has an ominous ring um, in uh, Soviet or communist uh, theory of the army taking over, but revolution in military affairs. And Israel doesn't want Hezbollah to have even five or ten such precision guided munitions, because then they would be able to target Israeli air bases, Israeli headquarters, some critical infrastructure uh, assets, Ben Gurion airport, and so on and so forth. So Israel is dead set against allowing uh, Hezbollah to get such a capability. So when the Secretary General of Hezbollah, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, claims that uh, his organization does have uh, the sophisticated capabilities in order to pinpoint target uh, various strategic sites in Israel, he is He's not lying. He is projecting his vision um, to the future into the uh, present. By all uh, intelligent uh, observations, uh, not to say uh, more, um, Israel is convinced that Hezbollah is at least a year away from getting this capability, not because uh, it is planning ahead, Hezbollah, but because Israel is systematically acting against their getting not only the uh, missiles themselves or the kits uh, to convert um, unsmart uh, missiles into smart ones, but also because even the factories are being hit by Israel, so Hezbollah is not yet there. Uh, not only that, uh, for Nasrallah, these actions serve as a pretext why he is not ready yet to act. He will act in due course, and the time is not ripe for that.
Dr. Lerman, I had a discussion with a senior official uh, in the Israel Defense Forces uh, uh, with regard to the uh, uh, various happenings around uh, the attack on Sunday, and he uh, indicated to me that the Air, Air Force, the Israeli Air Force, was ready to carry out missions to wipe Hezbollah's uh, precision-guided missiles aspirations and, and various plans and, and uh, missile uh, 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 weapons caches and so on. Uh, within the first few hours of, of uh, such an attack, if if indeed were, uh, thank God that it didn't happen, but if there were casualties or injuries on the Israeli side. Do you think that uh, it was truly a mistake, uh, as uh, your colleague uh, just mentioned, Professor Inba, with regard to uh, not to do so? Well, timing is everything. And right now, there are two factors dominating Time. One is uh, an election period, and uh, the fact that it's very difficult for uh, a prime minister at this point in time to avoid the uh, the allegation that he has brought about a general conflagration in order to service his fight for a better margin or, uh, or a winning margin in, in, in the coming elections, which is now hanging by a thread. So uh, timing in this case, I think, uh, um, was very clearly um, a, a factor. And, and the IDF, for very obvious reasons, and throughout Israel's history, has, has never allowed itself to be uh, made use of for political purposes if there wasn't a compelling reason to do so. But there is another element uh, at work. Um, as Ephraim said, uh, the Iranians are playing a certain game. The game is to raise the level of tension, the Houthi operations, uh, tensions in Iraq, Palestinian Islamic Jihad provocations from the Gaza Strip that run clearly against the interests of Hamas to more or less uh, see how they can uh, negotiate uh, modus vivendi through Egypt and uh, and the Gattari uh, money suitcases. All of this is part of an Iranian effort to destabilize the region in response to the really murderous sanctions that they are facing. They are no longer trying to hide the fact that their economy is creaking. Mm -hmm. They openly speak about the fact that they have realized they are not going to survive four more years of Trump and may not, maybe not even one more year of Trump. So our interest is actually not to play into the hands and to let the uh, to, to uh, um, let these provocations ride while the sanctions stay in place, and possibly uh, uh, well destabilize the regime. Some would hope that happens from within, or force it to come to the table from a position of weakness. Uh, which was not the case, was not the way they played the game uh, with the previous American administration. That's the b really big issue. That's, that's where the nuclear question mm -hmm. uh, comes into play. So in terms of timing, uh, to basically be drawn into the Iranian uh, escalation game would probably not be the right thing at this moment, with one, with two major caveats. One, is that we intend to, con uh, clearly the government of Israel has made it very clear, the intent to continue intensively in the preemption and prevention effort against the uh, uh, weapon uh, ac accuracy project and other elements of Iranian activity on Ir uh, Syrian, and some would say also Iraqi sort. Uh, so we, uh, there's no intention of desisting under Hezbollah's threats. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, had there been significant casualties, uh, and this is where Hezbollah, uh, Hassan Nasrallah probably chose his targets, his, his one target, uh, pre precisely in order to be able to, to bring this to a conclusion quickly. Professor mm -hmm. well, uh, Inbao, to say something about the timing, because I agree ahead. very much with my colleague Iran that timing is very important. But if we talk about timing, we should uh, also take into consideration the Zarif uh, efforts to start negotiating with Trump a new deal. The foreign minister of Iran. Yeah. The, yeah. So uh, if uh, if this is indeed uh, the direction, I'm not sure we have an interest in uh, seeing uh, the American administration and the Iranian regime uh, 
restarting negotiations, because in my view, the Iranians have an upper hand at negotiations. They are much better negotiators than the Americans. And they will be able to drag on with those negotiations uh, for years, if needed. Uh, and this doesn't actually serve their own program uh, to achieve uh, some kind of uh, nuclear uh, uh, progress, which in the meantime, they can't do it. But this is, this, is uh, too, this is too clever an explanation for Netanyahu to adopt <laughs> for fear that President Trump will see it as an effort on Netanyahu's part to torpedo this uh, rapprochement. We don't but, have to explain. But, no, but there's, <laughs> there's uh, uh, one, one important element here. Israel doesn't want war with Hezbollah. However, it also doesn't want, should war start, to be in a position where Hezbollah has these precision guided munitions. So it's a very delicate game of trying to avert war by climbing almost to the verge of war, which is what is happening with these attacks against the precision project. It could very well escalate into the war Israel doesn't want. So it has to calibrate very, very carefully what it is doing. I would like to ask you, though, uh, Professor Inba, when we're talking about the timing, especially the election on uh, September the 17th, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has alluded several times to the fact that he will continue to assure Israel's security regardless of any political uh, um, calculations, of course, uh, for a politician that's uh, uh, not true reality. But um, in, in less diplomatic uh, terms, would you see Israel, um, if it senses a concrete danger to its security, uh, move beyond the current guidelines of uh, the so-called red lines dictated by Jerusalem? First, I, uh, I should make quite clear, I don't think it's possible for a prime minister to uh, ignore elections uh, that are, you know, in two weeks. So this is, he's a human being and, uh, you know, it's not possible. The big question is whether a war, even if it's... Uh, indeed needed, serves his political interests. And I'm not sure it does. It, there are two sides to it. If he wins quickly, oh, of course, it, it will be a great victory for him. And uh, um, he, has, uh, he will have the support of the people. And it may be translated into political victory. However, we know how war starts, and we don't know always how they end. <laughs> Dr. Lerman, I want, I want remember, actually remember to... Remember that uh, at one, af, after the Lebanon, the Lebanon War of 2006, uh, Prime Minister Le uh, Olmert was the single leader in the world uh, whose rates of approval were lower than the rate of growth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but may, may yeah. I comment on that? Um, there is a difference in perception. Many of Israel's enemies uh, could believe that Netanyahu is angling for such an escalation on the eve of election. They are wrong. Uh, from his point of view, uh, it is too much of a gamble because uh, the price would be paid immediately by Israeli civilians and soldiers, uh, while the uh, results, the achievements, would be seen only over time. But they would be uh, fearful, the Israel, the enemies of Israel, uh, they would not start anything which would lead to war. As you all mentioned, timing is essential for any uh, military decision making. Uh, Dr. Lerman, I want to touch on two points uh, as we're drawing near to the end of the program. Uh, one, is Israel well prepared militarily to withstand any uh, confrontation in the near future, as well as on the diplomatic level that uh, today's uh, age uh, demands both sides uh, to be equally prepared? And to what degree is uh, Israel actually deterring uh, Iranian action and Hezbollah action, for that matter, that would potentially deteriorate to an all-out conflagration? Two very important questions. Um, Israeli readiness, preparedness is under constant surveillance at uh, level of Knesset committees, uh, some degree of public scrutiny, um, internal defense establishment functions, and there have been a fierce debate last year about the level of readiness of our main striking forces, which traditionally have been armored 
Uh, Israel's military has been a tank army for many years, and people with a long experience in, in that field felt that the, we are falling behind in the level of readiness of our main striking forces. While we invest uh, significantly in PGMs, in air capacities, in in uh, in uh, fire and intelligence, uh, fire Nexus. intelligence Nexus as well as in uh, commando forces, uh, special forces, but, but and Iran, so, even so, the, so forth. Even the critics, and, and the debate but the is, critics is did, did, not, did, uh, did not question the quality of the tip of the spear, only the second wave. Right. Should, the, should the plans exactly. uh, go yeah, wrong right. and the second wave mostly of reserves? Yeah, the, the, the reserve, is, yeah. Israel's capacity to win wars historically was by uh, the reserve armored divisions. That's how we won. Uh, in, in 67, we turned the tide in 73, and so on. Um, I believe that at the end of the day, uh, this is a far more aggressive idea. Um, uh, both Eisenkot and certainly now Kochavi have uh, a philosophy of taking the war to the enemy. Uh, the hesitations of 2006 will not repeat themselves. Uh, much of Lebanon will be under Israeli uh, physical control uh, before Hezbollah would fully understand what happens to them. And that brings me to the next question. Are they actually deterred? I would risk um, the guess that to the extent that they can make their own decisions, they would not go to war with a military which has the capacities that Israel has when they are now hated across the Arab world. They are denounced as a terrorist organization by the key Arab players. This speaks to our international readiness. It's one thing to fight you know, uh, the Arabs when they enjoy international support, and it's another thing to fight a terrorist organization that key Arab countries denounce as a terrorist organization, like Hezbollah. So they would lose, and they would lose badly. However, last point, if Iran gives them the order, they would go. Indeed. Uh, Professor Inbal, closing sentence. I think that the Iranians definitely are not deterred by Israeli activities. We see tremendous determination to continue what they've done in the past. And probably this is true to some extent also of Hezbollah. Indeed. Well, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank Dr. Lerman, Mr. Oren, and Professor Inbal for being here with us today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. You just watched TV7 Jerusalem Studio. We encourage you to pray for the challenges raised in today's program. If you were blessed by our production, please consider supporting TV7 Israel. The details of our respective bank accounts for donations from Europe and the United States appear on the screen. Your generosity allows us to continue to serve God's calling, to broadcast content that truly matters through TV7 Israel from Jerusalem.